This paper was first presented at the Learning Through Reconstruction Study Day hosted by the Medieval Dress and Textile Society. It was an in-person event at Lancaster Hall Hotel, London on Saturday, the 29th of October, 2022. This presentation may be shared or used for research as long as it is properly cited. Learning Through Reconstruction at Madats, London, UK. Hello, my name is Gerald Livings, Jerry, and I will be your host for the next 30 minutes. A bit about myself, I am a professional bench jeweler, which means that I am the guy in the back of the jewelry store making and repairing jewelry. I am also an independent researcher of historical jewelry manufacturing processes, as well as being a professional jewelry educator. I work to share my knowledge and skills with anyone I can through videos, blogs, print, and personal education. And speaking of that, the cards I handed out have my website information on them. You can find this presentation there, as well as general jewelry information, bench tips, and my musings about jewelry and the jewelry industry. My blog, Jewelry Deconstructed, is also on my website. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, what this has to do with textiles and learning through reconstruction. Because sometimes we have to deconstruct something before we can reconstruct it and learn from that reconstruction. I also want to let you know that sometimes my mouth gets ahead of my brain. Please let me know if you need me to stop and clarify something. I am happy to do that. Dealing with dress and textiles, Many of you have come across aglets. The story I will be telling you today is about my journey clarifying and extending the typology of aglets through a practical application of craft and experimental archaeology. What is experimental archaeology? It is an approach to filling gaps in our knowledge about the past which cannot be filled through other conventional archaeology. Essentially, we are going to learn more about aglets by applying jewelry making knowledge to discover how they might have been made in the past. While for this event, the call for papers asked for a theoretical examination of the value and use of reconstruction, remaking, and experimental archaeology, I'm going to treat this as more of a practical conversation. I'm going to break this into three sections and tie each one into learning through reconstruction as I go. First, what are aglets? Second, examples of how we can apply craft work and experimental archaeology to aglets. And third, clarify and extend the typology of aglets based on the knowledge from the first two sections. So how many of you are wearing shoes right now? Hands up if you have shoes on. In that case, there's a good chance that you have aglets with you. Aglets, lace tags, and shapes are all terms describing items that are in some way used to finish the ends of laces, such as shoelaces, thongs, or cords. I am defining an aglet as an object a separate terminal applied to a cord to make the tip rigid. In this definition of an aglet, the focus is more on function, such as protecting the cord from unraveling, easing passage through an eyelet of some sort, or adding weight to the cord. I'm going to state that for my research, an aglet is a separately constructed object that is added to a lace or a cord. Aglets have been around for a very long time and are still in use today as functional and or decorative elements on laces for shoes, corsets, and other clothing. Many people will recognize the plastic and metal ends on their shoelaces as modern aglets. Now while aglets have been around for a very long time, I've only spent a few years so far learning about them by applying craft and experimental archaeology. I would like to share with you a little bit about what I have learned through the deconstruction and reconstruction of aglets. Let's dive in. 
When I started looking into aglets in 2014, all I could find in books and online was about 20 total pages of information. Seriously, that was it. There was almost nothing about aglets in print and mainly a Phineas and Ferb cartoon online. I discovered that in the past, the typology of aglets was created by archaeologists that had a need to describe them as they were found on archaeological sites. As the years passed, the typology was extended to include three types of aglets. Unfortunately, I discovered that the definitions of types 1, 2, and 3 aglets were too specific and yet too broad to properly categorize almost all aglets. I found that I had a lot of questions, so I set about finding answers. Through a study of images and tracking down primary sources, I began trying to make aglets myself that would show the same characteristics as those found during archaeological excavations. I quickly found out that for every question answered, I found more questions. So I turned to my background as a jeweler to reconstruct aglets through experimental archaeology. Here are my insights during my journey of learning through reconstruction. To better experience learning through reconstruction, I feel it is important to use tools similar to those used by the artisans and craftspeople of the past. To this end, I attempt to recreate as many tools as I can that would mimic the tools used centuries ago. I made my own files from 18th century wrought iron spikes, burnishers from brass and bone, I forged my own pliers, and I use a set of tweezers from the Thames that are centuries old. I use an alcohol lamp and blowpipe to solder with solder that I made myself to closely recreate what I see. To get started, I began to collect aglets through various sources, then carefully examined them to reveal clues as to the tools that would have been used to create each one. So what did I see? Marks on the brass hint at the nicks on the blade of the shears used to cut the metal. Marks on the folds imply the usage of pliers. Bends around the rivets imply the hole was punched and not drilled. A question I wanted to answer when I started my research was, were pliers used in the manufacturing of aglets? I thought, as a jeweler, that they would leave too many tool marks that would have to be removed later, thus creating more work. It turns out that the answer is yes, pliers were used. And the answer is also no, pliers were not used. Type 1 aglets are not made using pliers. Type 2 and Type 3 aglets are made using pliers. I will get more into the typology later. I had requested some pictures of aglets used in an illustration in a book, and the curator of the museum where these were stored was able to locate the aglets in the illustration, but was unable to take detailed images. He graciously sent them to me for examination, but unfortunately, they were too fragile and most of them did not make the trip halfway around the globe intact. While this was a tragedy from a preservation standpoint, it was a stroke of good fortune for examination. On this particular aglet, only one side of the seam made the trip. This is the top section of the broken aglet. The bottom image is a sketch of mine of the aglet fragment under the microscope and it makes it easier to see the plier marks. The top of the aglet is on the right and the seam is on the bottom of the image. I believe that the image shows that pliers were used during the manufacturing of this single type 2 aglet. This inner surface, having been protected from polishing, wear, and corrosion, clearly shows marks left by tools during the manufacturing process. The edge has a pattern of bends, suggesting it was folded over the open work lace that it was uh, on, then crimped several times along its length by a small set of needle nose pliers to tightly grip before the aglet was bent into a round shape. My experiments have supported this hypothesis. One way to secure an aglet to a cord is by using very small rivets. The riveting of an aglet is an important skill. 
an aglet would have to be riveted in a way that does not damage the eyelet of the clothing it is going through. As with larger rivets used in metal, leather, and other industries, a peening tool would have been used. A peening tool is basically a concave faced punch for smoothing over and shaping the end of an aglet. I hypothesized that this would have been the ideal tool for smoothing over and shaping the ends of the rivet so that it didn't snag, rip, or cut the threads of the eyelets. Additional tools would include various punches, a very small hammer, and a specialized anvil with half round grooves uh, to hold the aglet in place while it is being riveted. While you can make educated guesses and hypothesize, it is exciting to receive evidence that bolsters your hypotheses. This was one of the aglets from my collection. This picture shows two aglets. The lower one is an extant aglet in my collection and is a type 3. More on the typology later. I found it was decorated using a small punch with a concave end. Sound familiar? I took an aglet blank and made a similar pattern of punched decorations using my peening tool for riveting and burnished it into a type 1 aglet for comparison. As you can see, they are close to a perfect match. This tells me that my conjectured tool for peening over rivets can be cautiously considered to be documented with two points of data. One, extant aglets have been found with intact rivets that show evidence of being peened over with a tool like this. And two, the aglets that I made with rivets match closely to extant aglets in my collection to the point of that I am satisfied that my hypothesis is plausible. If this tool was available to aglateers centuries ago, it can be cautiously said that it might also have been used to peen over rivets as well as decorate the occasional aglet. While I need to find several additional examples to satisfy the need for documentation, I feel this is a perfect example of a practical application of craft and experimental archaeology showing us something that we did not know before. One way of finishing the ends of aglets after the cords or laces have been attached is to compress the ends slightly. In dress accessories, an illustration of a conjectured tool was drawn suggesting how to compress the ends of aglets on completed sets of points. I do not know if this tool was made and tried before this illustration was published in that book, but as you can see in the figure, when I made one to use, it worked very well for compressing the ends of aglets on completed sets of points. It is possible to get about 30 to 35 percent closure on the aglets. At that small of a cord size, it is not enough to secure the lace to the aglet by itself, but when combined with a rivet or an organic glue available at the time, it is very secure. This is a great example of experimental archaeology because someone thought about the finished form of aglets with an end that was compressed and then conjectured a tool that would give them results that match their examples. Take a quick look at this line from Shakespeare in The Taming of the Shrew. Got it? Okay. Shakespeare used the term aglet baby in The Taming of the Shrew, written in about 1590 to 91, but the term is not defined. Many Shakespearean scholars point to the 7th edition of a glossary of the works of Shakespeare by the Reverend Alexander Dice, which states, An aglet baby was a small image or head cut on the tag of a point or lace. That such figures were sometimes appended to them, Dr. Warburton has proved by a passage in Mesere, the French historian, Portent même sur les aiguillettes de petites de mort, Malone. This was published by Swan, Sonnenschein and Company in the year 1880. 
Thank you to Google Translate. Uh, we know this means wearing even on the agulets of the little ones of death. Not only do we learn through reconstruction, but we can also unlearn. In the world of aglets, I often hear the term aglet baby. An aglet baby is universally considered to be an actual physical item from the past, so I went looking for examples to add to my collection and to reconstruct. I came up empty. How is that possible? Where did this term and definition come from? Remember, this was published about 290 years after the term was first used. A person in the past quoted someone who was quoting someone else that what they wrote proved what somebody else wrote about Shakespeare was accurate. This would imply that Mesere via Dr. Warburton has evidence of these points with a small image or head cut onto them. Following the trails has resulted in, well, nothing. I have not been able to track down a Dr. Warburton or discover who Malone refers to. There is a Francois Mesere, a French historian. I want to touch on the typology of aglets. When I started my research, there were three types of aglets in the accepted typology. The definitions were convoluted, confusing, and overlapped, yet contradicted each other. Through my work, I have expanded the body of knowledge about aglets. I decided that it was time to clarify and extend the typology of aglets, and this new typology has become the current standard. For type 1 aglets, the edges may overlap for a short distance at the base and or top of the aglet. These can be secured to a cord in a lot of different ways. Rivets, glue, compressing the tops, or a combination. According to earlier typologies such as Oakley and Markson, type 1 lace tags are found in contexts dating to the 15th and 16th centuries. I feel comfortable putting forth the hypotheses that type 1 aglets are not just found in context dating to the centuries, but earlier as well. I'm still working on verifying this for myself. I hope to have a definite answer to context and dating soon. Most of the type 2 aglets in my collection are quite small. I suspect these were used on woven lace or more delicate items many times. This double grip on a piece of lace makes for a very secure hold. Coupled with a bit of adhesive, these would be very hard to knock off and lose. I'm beginning to suspect as well that some sort of resin was used to help secure these. On type 3 aglets, the inner side of the seam may or may not be bent in to hold the cord or lace. And again, some sort of resin might have been used to help secure these. I am still unsure about how common type 4 aglets were before the modern era, but there are more examples being found and documented. There are several now on the Portable Antiquities Scheme Pass website. Now, these are very common with modern aglets, such as Yeezy style and others. Bone, horn, stone, pottery, amber, etc. If it is an aglet and it is not metal, it is a type 5 aglet. I am still working on finding documentation for these that might be from the early medieval to medieval eras, but until then, there are several great examples from the modern era. Remember when I said the focus of aglets was on function? Well, type 6 aglets are the exception to the rule. These can be made like any other aglet in manufacturing, but the main determination is that they are decorative and not functional. The first image is a set of silver type 6 aglets made by myself. At 25 millimeters long and 13 millimeters wide, these are not really functional. Made to be filled with perfumed paste, these are meant to be sewn to clothing as a decoration and as a way to smell nice. A modern Yeezy style aglet, while a type 4 aglet, will also fall under a type 6 because they are purely decorative. That's the center image. Also, the aglet pictured on the right is a type 1 aglet uh, that is either late Georgian to Victorian with a soldered bead attached to the end. It is designed to use on the end of a military decorative cord called a forager. 
This is a cord worn on the shoulder and awarded as an honorary decoration to members of a regiment or other unit that has received a special citation, many times from a foreign country's government. So hitting the main points of the last half hour, through applying what we know about making small items and through trial and error, we can rediscover how items might have been made in the past. An archaeological reconstruction, when carefully done, will help with gaining information that is impossible to obtain from solely examining original artifacts. In my experience with aglets, I have found this to be true. While we may talk and examine items and come up with theoretical models for their construction, it is the practical reconstruction that gives us insights into refining our theoretical models. Then by applying the knowledge we just learned to another reconstruction, we can further refine our models as well as come up with the new hypotheses. It is a cycle of discovery and rediscovery that never ends as the questions we answer and that we need to find answers for lead us into areas we never expected. So look at your feet once again. Those aglets don't seem so insignificant now, do they? So what is the takeaway from today's talk? Look at even the smallest parts of what you do and see how they fit like a piece of a puzzle to complete the whole picture. It is by examining all of the parts and seeing how they fit together that allows us to further our research. So I'm asking you to stop and take a good hard look at your research and ask yourself, what can I do to deconstruct and reconstruct this? and then find something new to share with everyone. I would like it very much if all of you could visit my website for more information and to download a copy of this presentation. Feel free to email me uh, with any questions, insights, and comments. Suggestions for new lines of inquiry and corrections are always welcome as well. Thank you very much for attending my talk today.